So, um, as I said, there's very, very many different um, <coughs> meanings of user experience, but probably not really different meanings, but people understand different things when they talk about user experience. When I actually ask my customers when they, when they brief me, hey, I want, I want a positive user experience, I ask them, okay, what does that mean to you? And I want to make a, a quick test here in the audience. Um, what do you guys think a positive user experience is? So what comes to your mind when you hear positive user experience? Any volunteers? Thanks, Amelia. Well, uh, So that's a lot of utility really, for this effectiveness and efficiency. Mm -hmm. No need for you to mind. Okay. <laughs> Good. Um, okay, so, so, so sort of like joy? Yeah. Okay. Okay, so having fun for yeah. using it, yeah. That's pretty cool. Um, this is quite close to the answers that we usually get. So it's the joy while using the product, so we hear that a lot. So that's sort of this joy of use approach, and that's been popular like five, six years ago. And we hear usability a lot, so that's really, really important. It has to have good usability, um, a really cool design. So to notice that design, that's interesting. Um, so it was really just about getting to the goal that we really want to achieve. And some customers really just say good like Apple. So we heard a bit in the keynote today and just about my more to report in the case. And some customers just come up and say, yeah, I want I want that application and it should work just like Apple. Okay. Um, not so sure whether that's really everything that's going to constitute a positive user experience. Um, as I mentioned to Norman before, so they have this, this norm, this standard, which you know, I'm from Germany, so everything has to have a standard, sort of. So they have this um, um, ISO 9241 standard for usability, and they were actually working on a standard definition for user experience, and it's not quite closed yet, but I think there's a largely accepted sort of definition for user experience that always includes these three areas. So it's the expectation, it's the usability, and it's the assessment. And um, if we go into a bit more detail, um, expectation refers to everything that the user has in mind before actually using the product. So that could be influenced by previous knowledge, by marketing, by previous usage of systems that were sort of like this one. So if you use one coffee machine, you expect the other one sort of works the same. You just press that button, put some coffee, and just boost your coffee. <coughs> um, then we have um, usability. Usability is defined to have three dimensions. Now you could probably say that there's a fourth dimension, and I would go as far as to say there are four. Um, the first one is the effectiveness. So that refers to, can I do with this system what I want it to do? So can I achieve my goal? Then we have efficiency, that is the how of achieving that goal. So we call something as a, that usage should be free of something that we call critical incidents. And then there's satisfaction, so you should be able to achieve those goals you know, in a manner that sort of satisfies um, your needs. And for me, a fourth dimension of usability is really visual design. So my visual designers hate me for saying that, um, because they think that visual design is something different. But at the end of the day, it aids in making how um, you achieve something um, much better. So that's really also a part. And then finally, we have the assessment. So that's how the user assesses his usage after actual using the product. And I think that assessment is positive. And if, every, if all of those three um, areas are positive, that's when are positive, that's when you can say okay, yeah, this has been a positive experience. Um, I can see this is um, a bit theoretical right now. So um, I'm gonna try um, to 
present you with a rather simple example to go through these different areas that I've just mentioned. It's not the boat, that's not the lake, so that would probably be fitting. Um, let's take a look at something like an electric car. Um, if we think about the expectations that a user would have or a person would have that's buying or driving an electric car, we could say in a simplified way, okay, it should behave like a regular car. Um, and I'm not going to say yes. So, I mean, uh, I agree it's probably a bit simplified, but that's my, that's the core expectation that users might have. Um, then, with respect to um, usability, um, we said that this is effectiveness dimension. So, can I do what I want to do with that system? And are all the different tools there? Um, that help me get to that goal. So ideally that car has four wheels, it has brakes, it has windows, um, it has a trunk, it has a battery, so everything that you expect from a car is there and it's at the position that um, you need it, um, when you need it, and it just makes you, allows you to do what you want to do. And then with um, respect to the efficiency dimension, so that's the how and the satisfaction dimension, and maybe even visual design. You could probably say, okay, it can be used without any errors, hopefully, so you don't drive against the next wall. Um, it accelerates nicely, people look at the car, it doesn't make any sound when it goes by hardly any sound from the engine. Um, it's just fun to drive. So summarizing that, you could probably say the usability of an electric car or this electric car is quite good. Especially if you would use ability to test it. I'm pretty confident that the results would be okay. So we would get a check for the usability. And then with respect to the um, assessment, it's most likely a yes as well, because my core expectation is to behave like a car, a regular car, it doesn't use gas. There it's met and usability is good. So my assessment is most likely to be good. So that's checks for everything. Good expectation, usability is fine, assessment is good. With what I've said before, we could say user experience is top. Right? I mean we are good in all areas. Well, um, I might have sort of tricked you when I said, um, let's just assume that my expectation is it behaves like a regular car and it doesn't use any gas. <coughs> That's actually what, we have, what happens a lot when our customers feed us with frequency. There is requirements in there that are just assumed. So somebody just writes down a feature, hands it to the agency, and the agency says, okay, I'll do it nice with the interface, I'll make it usable, it will look nice and um, then gets to a very positive user experience. Um, but, coming back to the electric car, I need to drive 250 kilometers every single day. And my electric car can do that without recharging. So this one underlying need is not taken care of. I'm pretty sure that people developing electric cars, they knew that. But they just chosen to ignore it, or just not take care of it, or just position the product differently. Right? They could have done this. They, they don't have to say, hey, here's your new lifestyle, super duper electric car. They could just say, this is your new vehicle to go grocery shopping. That would work. That would be a different position. That would be a different expectation with respect to the product. But, well, they don't. So, for a product user experience, it is really, really, really title to consider the user's needs and the requirements that result from those needs. So there's a difference between needs and requirements. And the latter is something that refers to a system. So in my example, the requirement could be my battery needs to have a large enough capacity to take me 250 kilometers. It needs to uh, recharge while driving, etc. That's a requirement. The need is I want to drive 250 kilometers a day. <coughs> um, 
And I said um, user needs um, is that it's not um, the features of the electric car are not referring to something that a person has just thought about in a, in a black room, but that we should really need to that we need to involve the users in sorry in evaluating those needs. So it's not in the when as an agency we come into the project life cycle when the requirement definition is done usually. And that requirement definition is done without having users be part of that process. And well, I'm pretty sure that you need to do that. And you don't have to send out a gazillion questionnaires to I don't know how many people. You don't have to um, do focus groups with hundreds or thousands of participants. There's actually tools that are much less time consuming and then in the effect are much less expensive than even our customers still think. And um, one of those tools, oh sorry, no, there's another side effect for it. Um, do you guys know what Gimbal decisions are? So let's trademark Wired magazine. Highest paid person in the community. Um, I kind of like that phrase because we get that a lot in the projects that we do. So you don't want to say so you have a feature list, you go on to the project, you define the user interface, and then somebody at a specific position says, but I want that feature to be in that product, and it's the most important feature. And then you need to change. I know sometimes 50% of what you've done before. And if, but if you have asked users before what the actual needs are and derive requirements from that, you have a pretty strong weapon in your hands. But you can say, well, yes, that's your opinion, and I fully valuable thank you. But your users, the buyers that are actually buying their product, they think differently. So maybe we should reconsider um, what we think. So now I'm coming to the methodology. So that's why that usability engineering certification was so important, because there's a methodology within a usability engineering process um, that is that's very well suited to extract those needs from your users or buyers. <coughs> so you can make sure that you meet your expectations. And that tool is uh, something that we call context interview. What you do in a context interview is that you define, well, first of all, you define out what the context is. In the electric car context, it's not the question is not what do you want from an electric car. The question is, if you want to go from A to B, how do you do that? And then you create guiding questions for that interview that are at the beginning are very, very broad, and then they become more specific. And um, so you just sort of have a chat with your with your interviewees. And um, the people that you interview, they come from user groups that are only three to five people strong. And usually, you don't need more than two user groups for a context and system. So that's 10 interviews to make sure that you really know what your buyers want from that system that you are creating. So you do that interview. And then you sort of write an essay, like an episodic essay, of what they have said with relation to their context. And then you analyze that essay, you record that, you take your notes, you analyze that essay, and then you sentence by sentence, you go through that essay and extract the need. So the need, in my example, was I need to go 250 kilometers, otherwise a vehicle is of no use to me. And then from that need, you extract what we call requirements of use. So that's really, that's your feature. That's your user-centered feature right, right there. And since we acknowledge that our customers, of course, they have their opinion, and it's valuable that they have their opinion because they're experts in their domain. So they will have also requirements. And what we do then is, so this is not part of the official usability engineering process. That's something that we've added in. Uh, over the last year. So we sort of reverse engineer those features. Think about what could be an implying need of that feature and try to map that to the requirements of use that, are, that the actual users told us. 
And then we match them, we give them a priority, and that's the point in the, in the, in the project life cycle where you create system requirements. A system requirement is of no use if there is no requirement with use that relates to it. You just don't have to have that feature in your system. It's, it's as simple as that. You're creating products for consumers, for buyers, for users, and so that's the only thing that's relevant. This is resulting from the requirements of use. But the feature list that we get, 8% is system requirements. <coughs> So, you can say that uh, my final five cents with respect to um, this talk is that in order to create a public user experience, you need to know what the needs of your buyers are. You need to have a methodology to extract user requirements from those needs. That's how you get a public user experience. So, at the end of the day, this whole presentation is a plea towards my industry that I work in. Um, to involve users in the process of requirement definition when you do create new products and systems, and maybe get a mix expert into the project from the beginning and not when your requirements are already set. So, thanks. <laughs> Happy to take any questions. Um, how you build those user groups. Um, it's not a marketing segmentation that you use when you build those user groups. It's um, you just define the technical affinity, if, if it's a technical system. And what's important is that uh, people that you ask actually have some experience with the task at hand. And gender is no um, criteria, so it doesn't matter whether that's female or male. Um, the only age marker that you have is below 50 and above 50. Because um, after 50, um, they say that your cognitive and tactile capabilities become worse. So that's why you need to make um, a cut there. And that's how you select the people for that, uh, that user group. And um, it's, um, as I said, it's three to five. And that's, that's also uh, referring to your second question. So when you do those context interviews, because usually what you do is you, make, you do one context interview a day, you record it, and then you sit. So let's say you do that in, in, in the morning. And then the afternoon, you write that essay because you really want you still going to have all the things in your mind. And then you do it the next day. And what you get is that some, most of the times at the fourth interview or so, you're not extracting any new needs. That's just really a, you know sort of like a um, that they become how you say satisfied. So after five interviews, you're not getting any new needs. You're probably not going to get 100 percent. But that's not what you want. What you want is you want to know what's most important to the users, and you want to know about priorities so you can do the system in a fashion that brings the, the, the features that are most important to the users front. So for example, if you look at the feature list that we get, sometimes you would have to do screens that have maybe 18 functionalities on that screen. And it's quite strict. I mean, it's, it's, it's really logic that nobody will actually need all of those 18 functionalities. So we need to make sure, OK, what is the two most important ones? And that's why you can do it. Does that answer your question? Yes. And I'm wondering which of the colleagues of yours, which is the kind of thing that you can try to figure out, who may make a different opinion about what the product should be. So as an intuitive engineer, how do you solve this kind of problem? You should, so usually the differences aren't as strong as you might think. So there isn't between, let's say, like in Switzerland and Germany, there's not that much of a difference. Even though people from Switzerland have things differently, but um, usually you don't have that. Maybe let's say like the um, South American 
um, domain in European, there might be differences, so you just have a different user group from that. So, that's what I'm okay. One one more question. Uh, we use the microphone so we can hear it in the video. Thank you. Um, thank you, Marcus. That was interesting. Um, is one of the problems with user requirements though that people actually don't know that they require them until either they um, they realize they can have yeah. that or yeah. they see everybody else having that? Yeah. So, I mean, so, I mean, I think it's otherwise some of the real breakthroughs which are through with it. Yeah. I think if you sat by the friendly of these footballers in a room said to them, do you want to um, do short messages to the entire world starting off your employer? They probably said no, and then suddenly they were doing it. I'm very thankful for that question, and that is that is one of the, the main arguments that, that are running against the contest interviews. But we're not asking who you want to send so short messages. That's a really important thing. We are looking at the general context, and we're not asking them for requirements, we're asking them how they do things, and then we define needs, and the innovation can, for example, take part in translating that need to a system requirement. So if you're not asking, do you want to, do you want to have any short messages? You're saying, if you talk to your buddies about the last night's football game, how do you do that? How's that work? And do you, do you write, it? is it a bit long? So you usually talk about 30 minutes in monologues, or is it just saying, hey, that, that play is crap? But then you have your 140 characters in there. So stuff like that. And what you also have to keep in mind is that you don't do usability engineering or that this process to define a product. You have the product ID idea before. And then you sort of validate what people want or could want from that product during those contact handles. And then you go into rapid prototyping and so forth. So that's also I've left all that out. So it's really just about taking this context of use, get the needs, get the requirements, and also feed back those requirements into the realm of expectations, because this will make sure that your positive that you experience will be so much better, because manage that expectation. One last question. Thank you. Um, I'm coming from um, social sciences, and I'm working in HCI, and I've worked now for quite a long time. So this is, of course, a topic that is, is uh, very important to me. And I think the right use a very diverse uh, audience with people also with technical backgrounds. So I can see that this focus that you put it here is very important. So thank you for that, for uh, kind of emphasizing again that, uh, that user experience is important and that uh, you have to use needs in an early stage to uh, and it's more than uh, you said when you asked those questions. But um, the, uh, if you're in the HCI, I mean, there's this long discussion about what is user experience in the that I shouted out earlier, like in your internet, where that's kind of a very generic thing. But I think that when, what you outlined here is very much still use playing usability at first. So also, even like, say, taking the needs into account, this is something that is in, in uh, not, not that it has permeated its industry uh, all, and I think that's why it's important to still emphasize it. Uh, but isn't there like more difference between playing usability, like a good, uh, easy, effective, uh, efficient system, and really giving a good user experience, a positive user experience that's more than that? And so taking user needs into account is one thing, but I think you have different user needs. You have user needs that serve your usability needs. You have user needs that actually kind of make you, for example, if you go back to an example uh, from Interactive TV, where uh, you can have a very usable system with an EPG that serves your needs, where you kind of find all the, the programs that you want to watch. But if you have a system that actually kind of surpasses these needs, and all of a sudden you can watch it on your tablet, and it's effortless, seamless, uh, that it uh, switches there, and I can actually go and take it along with me. And so I'm, I'm saying these are also needs, but these are different needs than maybe just doing usability. So isn't the, the sorry, it's one more to interrupt, but I'm not sure because because usability does evolve into effectiveness. So that's that's the what can you do? And having like that stream on your tablet, that's something that you would find out in a process interview. People will tell you, I'm not I'm, I hate it when it's really, really and I'm watching that movie and it really gets gets me, then I have to go to the bathroom and I can't watch it. Yeah, so that's probably where you get the the, the false life to you. Yeah. So then you have for example you have 
there's a lot of models from maybe this goes to model. Sorry, we can have a discussion afterwards. But there's a lot of stuff from Hassan South, for example, also on, on joining and on user experience. So, <laughs> Good. <laughs> I, I totally understand your question. I, I do agree to some extent. So I mean, you're saying that there's, uh, um, you know, there's transition, animation, the, the, the feel of an application. But to me, that's all in the realm of, of usability. And what I'm really trying to say is that um, there is this usability methodology that is focusing on needs. And if you take those needs, and if you take them seriously, then you can apply them to the whole product. You might actually change product design. You might actually change your marketing campaign. So, for example, in the electric car example, you're not positioning it as a lifestyle vehicle, but as your grocery shopping vehicle. That just completely renders the expectations. And if you have, if you go um, into the usage of a product with a different expectation, then you, 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 your experience will be different because there's going to be a different match to your expectation. So that's really the core of what I'm trying to say. Okay, thank you, Marcus, for this interesting presentation. And uh, maybe you can give a little hand. And you will talk about an open platform for multi screen service. Hi. Um, so I'm going to present you an open platform for multi screen services. Um, my name is Jean-Claude Dufour. I'm a professor at Telecom Paris Tech, which is a uh, university, a small university dedicated to telecom in Paris. So um, the first two slides are to just set the stage. Multi screen, you've seen that probably. So multi screen is things around the TV, um, smartphones in your pockets, networks, tablets, whatever. And those are moving, changing, getting in the room, getting out of the room, getting out of battery, and stuff like that. And um, what would be, uh, what is multi-screen useful for? Well, for example, broadcasters want to keep their audience from doing other things on those devices, rather than looking on TV or doing stuff around TV. Uh, advertisers want to do better targeting. Uh, manufacturers want to lock people into their um, XYZ TV, XYZ phone, XYZ tablet. And so, but, okay, you, you've probably heard of that. This screen is a very, uh, very uh, overloaded term. So, on this slide, I'm going to spend some time and to tell you what we are not working on. So, for example, um, we are not working on multi screen with native apps. We believe, well, at least this user believes that it's terrible when, well, I have an Android phone and my partner has a, an iPhone and we can't do the same things on those two phones. Why cannot I start something on an Android phone and then pass it pass the service on to the iPhone. So to do that and to avoid the manufacturer silos, we really want to use web apps. And um, many people when they do multi-screen talk about synchronization. And if you uh, think about synchronization, you're going to think about synchronizing media. Right now I'm into services. Well uh, like uh, the, the kind of services that web apps can uh, for you uh, reserving a train ticket or recording uh, a future uh, broadcast or whatever. And it's, it's not synchronizing media, it's about synchronizing pieces, different pieces of software running on uh, different devices. So media synchronization technologies could be added 
um, CMSs and databases could be added to, but it's not the central point point of our um, platform. Multi-screen, some people uh, equate it with uh, uh, screen sharing. No, we want to have each screen used for different things. And actually, it's sometimes some devices may have no screen. You could have a, a need for computation. The computation would be done on your computer, not on your phone. Right. Okay. Some phones are rather powerful, but probably you don't want uh, long computations on the phone not to drain battery. Um, some uh, devices have existing services. The TV is capable of receiving a TV program, recording a TV program. So the TV will do it, even though you can order the recording from your phone, but the TV will still be doing it. And, um, okay, we don't want um, connections to a server and QR codes. These, these things, uh, so, uh, as soon as you use a QR code, you're actually sending a message to a server. And uh, OK, so you need a centralized server to reply, to help you with the service, to help you connect them. And that would not scale. Uh, for example, if we think about um, TV uh, stuff, uh, sometimes upon the word of the presenter, um, 50,000 or 100,000 people are doing the same thing at the same time. A server will just crash. Or maybe it's in the millions, but whatever. So we don't want to use that. And we also, we are, we are also, um, we require to do adaptation. Adaptation meaning if you started something on an iPad and you suddenly switch to a TV or to an iPhone, well, the screen goes bigger or smaller. And we also have to have adaptation. It's not yet in our variant of multi-screen. It's kind of um, <coughs> and the other. And so, um, what are we trying to do using other devices? Remove clutter from the main screen. We can. We also want to leave other viewers of the TV uh, undisturbed. So if you're using a second screen, it's to, uh, for example, have the interaction on your device and not on the TV because it would not be helpful for other viewers. We may want to present additional nonlinear content. We want, may want to improve interaction for typing, for pointing. We may want to, to address stuff to a single user in the sense of uh, push content targeted to a single person. And we may want to interact with a single person from the other direction. So when you're gaming, it's um, each viewer may want to uh, play separately. <coughs> So what's the environment for the kind of multi-screen usage that I've uh, uh, presented to you? Um, we want to use web applications. So web technologies, um, <clears throat> the presentation technologies are HTML, SVG, uh, so scalable vector graphics, and the less used MPEG uh, equivalent technology, DIPS. These are mostly implemented on all devices, especially HTML and CSS. Um, they allow you adaptability to screen size and more uh, differences between devices. And multi-screen means if you have something running on different screens, it means you have a distributed service. It means you have a piece of service on your tablet, a piece of service on your TV, and maybe a piece of service on your the database, the, the, whatever you've done is stored somewhere on the computer. And uh, that means, so if you have around the TV uh, some devices, 
that means that those devices have to discover each other. And there is nothing worse than having to do pairing. From a user perspective, pairing is a mess. And uh, if a friend comes in with another phone, it's not paired, so it cannot use your system. Well, if you have discovery, you can, so discovery technologies are AT&T, Bonjour, and other. Uh, you can basically um, do an easy discovery of the various devices in the room, and um, as soon as you discover them, you can start exchanging messages between them. And uh, okay, once you have discovery and messaging between uh, devices, uh, you can start to build up complex instructions, even though it's just a web app. Still, when web apps now have scripting, and you can do rather complex stuff. Um, and for example, there's a, a very interesting uh, document called Use Cases and Requirements by the uh, Web and TV Interest Groups of WWC that describes all that environment and what it should be. Standards to um, address those. So basically, there are W3C standards, MPEG standards, and a set of standards that I haven't uh, addressed, uh, talked about yet. It's the HPDTV. So that's the, the kind of space that we want to, that our platform is addressing. So let's go to one scenario in detail. Um, we have a TV with three viewers. The program has an interactive application, so the typical red button thing, and uh, only one, one viewer is interested. So obviously, at least in my opinion, obviously you should not have the interaction on the TV because it would be unhelpful for, the, for two of the three viewers. So one solution is the viewer takes a smartphone. It launches a service. The service discovers the TV as a device. It discovers the TV as something that exposes, that has available an interactive application. And then it connects to that uh, application, gets the application, and as soon as something is running on your on the smartphone, something is running on the TV, they discuss, they exchange, the service can happen. It's, the service itself can happen. So that's, I believe, the uh, more user-friendly scenario. There's another scenario which is preferred by people like, like Netflix. It's the TV discovering the smartphones and sending notifications or even sending an order to launch this application to the devices. Um, it is also possible to implement in our system, but uh, I would not recommend to uh, use that. So the requirements for, so I, I've said already that Okay, we, we are centering our platform on web technologies. We have a web app needs to be able to discover devices and services, launch app on other services, that's the Netflix uh, uh, part, use discovered services, advertise services, and respond to requests. Below our, in the web technologies, you have UPnP, Bonjour, Dial. What's missing today uh, to be able to have this? Basically, it's the interface between a web app and those discovery and messaging protocols. So there's a standard, uh, a W3C standard in the works. So a generic interface with UPnP, Bonjour, and Dial for web apps. It's just it's very simple. Um, it's just one method. So there are two implementations. It's an asynchronous API, so it's a bit of a more complex programming than normal. And what's missing is uh, it gives you discovery. It does not give you yet 
exchange, exchanging messages, and exposing services. So, the platform that we have um, is something that uh, fulfills those requirements that I had in the previous slide. So the project is called Goltram. It's a mixture of a JavaScript library and a Java agent. It works with all major browsers on PCs, Macs, Linux, Android. And that means you can, on any of those devices, you start the agent, you start the browser, and in the browser, you start a web application which uses our JavaScript API. It connects to the Java agent. The Java agent does the discovery, the communication, the service, the service advertising. And then you can uh, discuss between the web app to the agent with, a, uh, with the service services. Discovered services can be existing UTMP services like the TV, the firewall, or whatever. Uh, some people say there are uh, refrigerators interface with UTMP in Japan. And uh, these could also be services uh, exposed and implemented by other web apps. And uh, the protocols used in between our web sockets or socket IO. Uh, socket IO is a sort of generalization of web sockets, allowing us to have more than just um, PC, Mac, and Linux uh, Chrome style browsers, but also uh, the, the very simple Android browser, the TV browsers, the HDB TV browsers usually don't have web sockets, but they work with socket IO. Our platform is open source. It's LGPLv2. It's available on, on GitHub at the moment. Just uh, the simple version. The complete version is going to be uh, available uh, later this year. And um, yesterday, we uh, a guy called Daniel was, was insisting that these platforms should be very, very easy to use and require very few lines of code. Well, if you want to use our system in your web app, you just need to have two or three lines, including two or three JS libraries. To discover service, you call one function and get a free, uh, define one callback. So that's a function that gets called whenever you have the result of that function. To use a service, you have also something very simple. From the service ID of the service you discovered, you get an object which you can call, just like the service where in your web page, but it's supposed to know. And to expose a service, same thing, it's, very, it's a very easy uh, procedure. And with that, I'm um, uh, taking questions. So the, the our project is called Run. So on the with this URL, and I get the Coltrane platform um, URL on this page. Thank you, Jean Jean. Uh, some questions. You were saying that the Netflix option that the device pushes a message onto your screen is not your preferred one. Why is that so? Because custom notification is always terribly painful. Uh, of course, it's always easier in terms of adoption rates to present this issue. Okay. Um, when I discussed with user studies people, they were all agreeing with me that not pushing, not forcing your tablet to start an application was, uh, well, no. Forcing your tablet to for, to start an application was a bad option, um, just as, as a principle, which was my natural uh, reaction. I don't want uh, anyone, a broadcaster or whatever, even someone I pay, uh, their channel I paid for, to start something on my tablet. Just don't want that. 
the platform, our platform allows you to do both ways. But uh, well, you know, if it's just a push, push message and, and you yourself can on the side to start with the application, it's just about knowing that it's available. Because if you think about the marketing of the application, it's hard for people to tell people, hey, it's out there. And if you are not pushing something, then it's a little more mm -hmm. hard. Um, maybe the, the problem I have currently with the HTTP uh, version 2 uh, standardization is that they basically just want uh, uh, discovery and then launch application, which means they would not allow uh, a, a less, a more user friendly way uh, to be implemented at all. Um, from that's that's what I insist on. Thank you. Give a hand to our center. would be uh, coming from uh, Rashid al Hassan. Fortunately, um, we are, for this uh, session, we're missing out on this interesting perspective uh, from the African continent. Uh, the presenters cannot be here, but uh, we will try to accommodate this presentation in the afternoon. So, um, if you would like to have a view on the Nigerian perspective, please join the afternoon sessions and we will try to have a view on Skype. Um, this does not mean you're getting time to lunch, because, <laughs> uh, uh, because uh, Sebastian will fill in for Rashida, uh, but first we will hear uh, Mark McInnes. Yes with uh, the development of the University Design Guidelines for Digital TV and so Um, yeah, I thought I'd start off by watching the TV. Uh, why not? So, um, this is actually a Panasonic TV. Um, because I'm just going to show you a very short clip of this, uh, this TV talk to you. Tell me which channel I'm on. So a little research in here. 
when you do make a mistake, it actually can be very difficult to recover from. So you end up in you end up in some kind of system and then you don't know where you are. And my father in law, for example, is ninety three. I mean that's that's pretty old, but in most respects he's very sharp, he's he he was extremely intelligent. Um and he's got this need to be to be happy to be able to make digital even have a choice. He's got this need to be and literally every other day you get to send out there, you can't get back to what you know. And, and that's all he wants to do. And luckily his neighbour has his vacuum to send through the and luckily his neighbour is now losing patience with him because he keeps going out there to get him to fix it. So um, what makes TV more inclusive again? Uh, well there's a lack of built-in accessibility. Um, and also that comes in terms of the thing alternative. So you can have a cemetery view, for example. Somebody who didn't need this spoken interface that a blind person used could quite happily have that TV for years and not know it was there. So this isn't any kind of um, uh, it changes the normal interface. It's an alternative interface. And some of you may be familiar with this in your your iPhones, I'm sure you all know this too. I'm um, ready to have a few to you can specifically hear it. That's too it's, it's too quiet. Basically, if the screen is completely blank, I can read that. It's now the screen is completely blank. It's a screen. And then all the apps, a lot of them I can read. Um, so these things are becoming pretty standard. It's built in that kind of functionality. And again, it's building functionality for um, increasing the font size. The people who use this one is a little less than the iconic. Um, alternatives, things like having alternative remote control. Um, like I say, my father in law, he bought that home, only one remote control that came with it. And if he wanted to have one, he'd have to find it with it. So this isn't really an alternative. Um, fundamentally, there's a lack of universal design. There's a lack of taking account of the uh, extreme uh, diversity that actually exists in any user population. Um, and that's, that's what it's all about. So, we've created some um, universal design guidelines for television. Television curriculum. Um, that covers the uh, hardware, the alternative interfaces, the programs themselves, and the program content, and the whole service that you get when you buy a TV service, like um, from somebody like UPC or something like that. But just to give you some idea of the kind of the kind of idea, ensure the remote control button releases the press independently, give you the way to get back to another place. We've talked about that. Make on screen information for users in those sites, we've talked about that. Allowing individual users to configure the user interface. A full of things. So these are the typical kind of things that are in the user's There's actually 200 individual guidelines in them. Um, that's the address, the URL, if you want to go and look at them. Um, Universaldesign.ie slash digital TV. Um, this is what they cover, um, the hardware, including the connectivity and setup, which is very important. So if you have problems connecting all the wires to your next channel, you simply can't have a system. Sometimes you need a friend to your neighbor, it's difficult, especially in the internet. Um, on screen interfaces, the most controls, spoken output, which we talked about. Uh, there's a lot of concerns about how to do spoken output properly. Um, it's interesting, Marcus, you said that what you thought I mentioned was the ability to use visual design. Um, obviously, for a blind person, that isn't the case. For the blind person, uh, in, in, in the spoken output, the, the, the similar kind of design that you have to do to make sure that the cues are there and they're being understood in the same way that this design is able to be adequately effective. So, there's a lot of guidelines about that. Uh, there's a whole kind of about the documentation of consumer information, customer services, reception, and content, including 
So, um, the paper that we submitted for this conference is a lot about how the guidelines look at the time. It is, uh, oh, it's a, it's a university design guidelines, you have to take the university design process to take the guidelines. So, um, first of all, we looked at uh, existing guidelines. Um, these are new guidelines. Um, what they are is a compilation of lots of existing sources and a, a, a reworking of them, if you like. Um, because there's a lot of um, the different sources of guidelines that exist. Um, there's a lot of, they're, they're a lot different in different ways. And there's some of disagreement. Um, but there, there was no comprehensive one in place where all these sources were all these kind of small and so, for example, we've got guidelines from the Federal, which is part of the Finance Ministry for Culture and um, Cultural or something. Um, and then you've got the World Bank, and then obviously they have their so own guidelines. The Consumer Expert Group in the UK um, is part of the digital agency. They did a lot of work there, they've got a very good work. And then Digital Europe, which is the industry body for the two of you and um, the two of the three of the world, they have their own work. Uh, so there's lots of different guidelines where we go. Um, so we look at all these. Um, we also did introduce the guidelines of users, um, which is the, uh, the consumer fit and manufacturers of the world and visits and, and, and sellers. Um, broadcasters, the public broadcasters in Ireland and the um, independent broadcasters, network operator point you can see this for example, um, um, access service producers, this is people who produce health access, um, and policy makers, uh, in this case it's just the radio, the regulator for television um, services in Ireland. So that was part of the new discussion. They are the users of the guidelines. They are the people working with the information and using their work. They are the services that they are working with. We did introduce the guidelines to users at that age of the year, which is 19 of the uh, the users. They are the nine, nine. Yeah, this is just, just to say, this is the guidelines used to take the data to tell them. They told us a lot of them, and the people told us the things that they told us that they need this functional guidelines in order to make this thing right. Don't tell us how to do this, because we're all really changing. Maybe just tell us what you have to achieve from the user's perspective, and give us some idea you know, about how to go and figure out how well we've got it right, or um, things to do with the as well. Uh, we also uh, did a lot of interviews with end users of people searching and equipment. Um, and we talked to people with those disability. Um, and they, you know, they, funny enough, most of the things that they talked about are customer service. Actually. They, they have a very um, people with disabilities in the picture have very low expectations of um, consumer equipment and how easily it can be useful. Um, what they know about customer service is they know that they want to know the information that they provide. Um, so they're very, uh, they've got a lot of ideas about customer service and um, making a firm decision for that matter. So there was a lot of guidelines around that kind of thing. And then there was, of course, the utility and the utility of the equipment. Um, and it's so that it's true to your supervisor's post and access. Um, we also do an expert review um, and a public consultation. So that's, um, that's it really. Um, if you want to look at these guidelines, um, as I say, they are now the most comprehensive single source of the MIB. We've taken the advice from all these different sources, we sorted out the differences, we figured out okay, so which, of the, which of the sources are always saying this is a high priority, and which of them give that 
which of the lower saying this is a low priority, and that's how we're setting up the priority in the kind of sub-scan meta study of the rubbish of um, existing um, advice. And we've made them functional, but the rubbish guidelines are not functional. And they're all from different perspectives. Just as you would expect, the World Bank Union guidelines compared with the guidelines from the Digital Europe, the industry body, they're very, they have some differences as to what is essential and what is nice to have. Things that the World Bank Union might say is that is essential for the enjoyment of television. Digital Europe might say, well, that's not essential. That's nice to have because it's different. So we've tried to sort of have a So there's the, um, the URL. That's me. And really, while well, I'd like to just finish off by saying, we're very interested in going on the search process. If anybody is looking at um, going to find a quick end of the in 2020, um, then we'd love to join you. And I won't leave the print of the paper, because obviously the knowledge is increased in design, um, user requirements gathering, extensive knowledge and experience in that, and uh, particularly user testing um, would be a really good situation. Um, use the testing facility to be used. Um, and we have access to lots of older people and people with disabilities for the final and So, let's um, thank you very much. So, uh, first of all, thank you for this uh, interesting chat on disability teams with TV, and thank you also for showing. At least me again that the uh, UK and Ireland are so much ahead in terms of accessibility for TV uh, compared to my country, compared to probably uh, many countries in Europe. And uh, we have time for a couple of questions. Everybody is satisfied? Okay. Still, um, we will have time at lunch or at the social event to discuss some subjects. And uh, I'm happy to uh, have Sebastian Becker go in for Rashida. And um, he will talk about uh, TV and disability. Remember, it's actually the title, but um, uh, that we see um, social TV, audience loyalty. ACR and how you say you can do a explaining set of your speaker of rhetoric, so printed in the program, but unfortunately he had a visibility accident uh, and uh, has given birth to his girlfriend last week, uh, so he's not. Um, but I will talk about his uh, company, which is the case study of this presentation, so you will hear something of rhetoric rather than from rhetoric. Um, quick introduction, my name is Sebastian Becker. I founded a consultancy together with uh, some colleagues, including Marcus. Um, uh, when was it? Six, seven years ago. Uh, focusing on back then interactive television, but uh, interactive television is still not fully there yet. So it's a bit wider today, uh, our say, work field. Um, we are focusing pretty much on APD platforms. Um, and the domain is digital TV and the other approaches. So today I want to bring one or two examples from the social TV domain. Uh, I think usability and the general guidelines uh, guiding it uh, are key for any projects, but in the end, so for project to be successful, there has to be more than usability, of course, there has to be a good idea about the service itself, uh, and proper funding, etc., etc. 
And uh, during the last year, we could take a closer look at uh, some of the, uh, most of the social TV uh, platforms out there. Uh, and I want to summarize it a little bit, um, what, what we've seen and what we've found. Um, so if we answer ourselves the question, is social TV, of course, we could have a, an independent presentation about the definition side. Uh, I'm sorry. I don't know. Yeah. I'm, not, I'm not seeing the screen. So. Okay. Of course, we could have a separate session uh, about the um, uh, definition of social TV, but I want to spare this. So, social TV in my um, view means you can interact either via chat input or via um, other means of interacting with an application that is related to uh, what TV is broadcasting. That given time. Um, and although we all would agree basically that social as a basic uh, human need, uh, interactivity and communication is a driving force that should uh, change the future of television, uh, we also uh, realize that it will not, not happen overnight. Uh, we are now into the third or fourth year of, let's say, social TV. And if you look at Facebook with the integrations of uh, set the box manufacturers or TSA manufacturers or broadcasters or platform operators, we could certainly agree that we are not fully there yet. Um, if we look at social TV startups, we see a phenomenon that most of them are trying to copy successful companies like uh, Foursquare or Twitter. Um, they are not really solving a problem for operators or broadcasters. Typically, just just by having some uh, EEG or metadata and allowing users to, to check in, and that's not really a very compelling uh, and deep uh, app experience. So, a product that is too simple is often um, resulting in, in too simple business models, and those uh, companies will disappear a lot. Um, my favorite social TV app. Uh, still is uh, Zbox from the UK. I think most of you have uh, seen it or used it. So we will talk a lot about Zbox. But they are really solving the problem for operators and broadcasters. They are enriching metadata. Uh, and they are using metadata as a navigation paradigm, which is making a lot of sense, but nobody is really doing it uh, except for them. And they have a multiple business model, uh, which is, of course, uh, helping uh, not only to get funded, but to stay there, because uh, most of the um, partners in the market will find some way of meaningful, also meaningful business cooperation with the C-Box. Um, so although we are still at the early stage, uh, some things are here to stay. Um, a is TV will be on the move uh, without tablets and smartphones, so that's not going to change anymore. Uh, and mechanisms such as gamification um, that are rooted in, in the human psyche and the human behavior uh, are important uh, push factors for these kinds of apps. Um, and it is still very important um, to create apps that are um, really compelling. Because I want to spend the, the, uh, all the way here from the TV screen to the point of sale, I've uh, drawn this chart uh, showing you the greener it is, the, the more mature this market segment is. Uh, giving you a quick overview, if we think about uh, different building blocks for like uh, content over VOD and interactive to social TV, and on which platforms these uh, uh, services or building blocks for social TV apps are existing. Um, you can see that, especially in terms of point of sale, um, there's still a lot to cover. Um, second screen or tablets and, and the web are moving and gaining ground. And the TV, although it's uh, a quite mature device, is still having some areas where we can make progress, not only in terms of inclusion, but also in terms of new services. So the one uh, example I want to go uh, through with you today is a, a really fresh startup called TV Smiles uh, in Germany. Um, it has been founded in February and the beta test started in March. Um, and it's about rewarding viewers for watching ads in case. So I'm not, I don't want to talk about the sense of these apps. Uh, I think that would be a, 
um, so, so things we rendered in use over the past uh, two or three weeks, so ranging from prison to um, the super uh, spies in the UK. Um, we can discuss a lot about uh, the meaning of, of these apps and how meaningful it is or how much of this, how much sense it makes to give all our usage and personal data away. Um, but let's just assume that people will still do it tomorrow uh, and will not change their behavior completely. Um, <coughs> if we think about more or less a bonus program for watching TV ads, why is it making sense in general, and why is it making sense now? So some facts. Um, the usage of second screen um, devices is increasing, and the attention is more and more shifting away from TV. So as soon as a TV program is becoming boring, people will just multitask and then go use Facebook or whatever. Um, Something that we've all already seen in the um, research around interactive television, if we have synchronized ads, um, so awareness and recall and engagement are higher. And uh, the mobile advertising market is growing uh, compared to the TV market, and there's still a lot of ground to cover to look at the table in the lower right. So what is TV Smiles doing? The app is uh, out there in the app store. You can just click go and download it. Um, by checking in, you will get uh, one point um, by playing brand-related uh, mini games. You will get the points by engaging in sweepstakes, quizzes, and other stuff. You will get points, and in the end, you can reward it either directly through their shop website or even at the point of sale. Um, so why is this first loyalty program for TV advertising even coming out now? Um, all the sentences I've marked in red are more important in my view than uh, the others. Um, so quite important is the fact that they're trying to close the gap between the TV viewing at home and the living room and the point of sale. Um, and that it has been developed in close discussion uh, and a dialogue with the advertising industry. This matters to uh, startups, and that's what I uh, see most of the times when I'm looking at business plans. They don't have an in depth understanding of the industry they want to break in. Uh, we all know the TV industry is quite conservative and it's quite complex if you want to take into account everything ranging from technology over uh, ad sales uh, to the content itself. Um, That's something we've also uh, already covered. Um, um, what is this here is that And so einfach geht's. Die CD Smiles App erkennt automatisch am Audiosignal die laufenden Werbespots und schon hat sie das Smile verdient. Mehr Smiles gibt es für weitere Interaktionen. Zum Beispiel ein Produkt für das Gewinnspiel, die Videos oder die Facebook. Oh, yeah. Or at the, the Parkland POS. 
Even this one is flimsy. You see, she does it with So that's the basic idea. Uh, interesting for brands and advertisers is, of course, that they are generating customer insights in real time. Um, so not only that data can be shared with um, the, uh, the user's agreements and privacy settings are allowing it, um, but also that uh, you can learn something about brand preferences and additional consumer insights, which are not uh, available in other apps. Um, and of course, users are um, users are, or at least they think that users will interact and give the data away because they are incentivized to do so. Um, some of the simple games that are um, developed so far, um, and these are, let's say, entertaining but still easy, and one of the main challenges for them, of course, will be uh, is this enough in terms of uh, engagement time over the longer run. Compared to um, competitors in the market, uh, at least that's the self uh, view that TV smiles have, um, they are much more focused on additional revenues than, than others. Uh, compared to um, other apps, they are providing maybe a bit less information because they are very much focused on apps uh, at this point of time. Uh, but of course, as I said, the effectiveness of, of the content is key, so they will have to adapt. This is not enough. Um, I don't want to go uh, into too much detail here. Uh, I think if the slides are shared, you can, you can read through this uh, and compare it a bit uh, with others. Uh, Shazam is already quite established now, at least in Europe, coming from the US. And they've created um, many uh, taggings also into um, ads. And the engagement rates, both of them and uh, the Shopkick are shown uh, quite uh, encouraging, at least for investors in, in, such, a, in such a company. Um, the underlying rationale why this is also making a lot of sense is that advertisers want to see um, more and uh, more measurable results for their uh, budgets they're spending. Um, and uh, if, if they see direct results at the point of sale, this is, will, of course, result in uh, additional shifts in the budget. Um, one of the founders of the company, which is always helpful, but is something that not all TV startups or startups can bring to this table is um, his previous company, his previous agency had existing relationships with uh, many bigger brands. So they can bring them uh, to the trial, which is, of course, helpful. Um, otherwise, you have to start from scratch. Um, yeah, that's something we've already talked about. They can redeem um, the points here at the end. Um, the main revenue source for the time being is mobile advertising and lead generation. Uh, but of course, if you um, aggregate that many data, of course, you will come up with other revenue sources uh, in the end. And um, we've seen that with uh, tablets and mobile phones, Users have started to, to move into that direction already. So many purchases are informed after uh, consulting your smartphone uh, at the point of sale. And of course, but that's not astonishing, that many of the TV viewers want to be rewarded for watching ads. Um, apart from the demographic targeting, and that's uh, also quite interesting, affinity based targeting is possible here, also social. Uh, targeting, and if you reach a higher status inside the app as a loyal follower, um, then of course you can get different offers than others. So just to sum it up, um, at least they hope that viewers will like TV smiles uh, because they want to get rewarded. Uh, they are doing anyway. Advertisers will like the app um, because. A, they are bridging the gap between the living room and the point of sale, and of course they're collecting data. Um, and the agencies uh, also will have their advantages. Um, that's the contact with Frederick in case you're interested um, in this. And I want to conclude by um, comparing it uh, with uh, CBOX, that's a screenshot of CBOX for those who, who don't know it. So they've really 
So you self-report that you're having, I don't know, a virtual table box at home or a sky virtual box at home. Uh, and, and then it's not automatically uh, syncing the content, um, but it's just using the data that is provided by the operator and it's enriching uh, the metadata. And if you watch something, in this case, it's a documentary, or, sorry, it was a documentary, I think, then you get, um, in this case, you get information, you get related links in the web, you get a, a social um, section here in the middle, um, you get affiliate sales from, from app stores, and on the right hand side, uh, you get additional metadata. So, what else is in this documentation? And in this way, you can really um, dive deep into a browsing experience that is guided by more uh, likes. Uh, and of course, you can also place a sponsored meta tags or t tags in there. Uh, so, that's a very, in the end, information rich. Um, application compared to what uh, TV Smiles is doing. Uh, it has many opportunities to, to uh, create income as well. Um, but it's more based on uh, an assumption that the viewer is really interested in finding out more. Uh, and we all know that uh, calculators are sometimes later than expected or what we look for. So if we compare the two, um, there are some commonalities and some, some differences. Um, so both are second screen apps, the main business model for TV Smiles is more on the advertising and digital generation side, while it's more diversified for Zbox. Um, both have advertising included, but Zbox has one of many business models for TV Smiles is key. Affiliate sales um, do direct for TV Smiles, we selling products at the point of sale or on other websites, and it's very important for Zbox, but they are using more existing app stores such as iTunes. Uh, the data is important uh, for both, I think. Um, partners base, yes, in Zbox, all, all broadcasters will get part of the screens. Um, for TV Smiles, it's more the product presentation. And the content recognition with Zbox is done basically at the beginning in self report uh, why TV Smiles is using it as well. Um, that's just a summary of the service. So the, the main summary is here in the lower right section. Um, if you think of launching such a startup, you have to find ways to break through. Uh, in this case, in the German market, that is more or less having a duopoly in terms of the advertising market between RTL Group and Prozinsereis Group. Uh, one of the two is to, it's your most likely exit candidates. So you have to see um, where you can place yourself. And then, of course, if, if you think it's not only uh, about the local perspective, but also about the international perspective, is such an app growing uh, fast enough to be received a, by consumers as meaningful uh, and also by investors? And then, in terms of going forward, the editorial challenge is, is maybe the most important thing to keep in mind here. So, are the games provided? Uh, and is there enough funding around um, checking it out? Uh, one other example that is coming from a customer project of mine last year um, is showing another way um, to attack the point of sale. Just run the video and then we can have a short discussion afterwards. <laughs> So Red Bull is having these Red Bull coolers in many supermarkets where the cans are uh, in capital. And what we've done here is we place the parts of the the bridge with a thumbnail and TV, basically. And the bridge is kept Wi Fi. So now all kinds of the video content can be displayed in the of sale. Market research has shown, has shown that um, the upselling rates or the sales rates of Red Bull cans is 20% higher than bridges that are manipulated than the bridges that the glass is free. And Red Bull is, of course, having content uh, both on the web and on social channels. Um, so they could use an app such as TV Smile. Not to sell more cans, but to also create a bridge between share and um, share outlets. So we have to keep in mind that TV or video is not only about 
choose that and how that's fitting. Um, for virtualizer, this may be a bit around the corner, but it's uh, some use case already in some point. Uh, and we're always kind of maybe happy now that they were um, spending a lot of money to have these bridges built there. Now that they're eventually being replaced. So this is close at hand. So, so some summing it up, but if we think about social TV, um, where do we have to spend additional brain power and time? Um, so people are not sinking enough with shows. So if you just expect that somebody who is a, I don't know, a fan of the film with a dollar baby uh, is tweeting and chatting all the time during the film, then you'll expect there are always spikes in in attention, so you can think of the presidential campaign, and we're following the Twitter stream. Of course, people were discussing the, the different uh, policy areas, but when uh, Mitt Romney was uh, saying the famous words that he has minors of women uh, that could join his team, um, then uh, the, the blogosphere was exploding, and uh, they were talking about this. So if you think, if you think Think about the metadata being content. It's not only, or maybe it's not. Um, it's not the most important thing to have the most obvious metadata in place for a film or TV series. Um, but you have to be flexible enough to react. So if something is kind of breaking news in the blog sphere, then you maybe have to add more or less in real time additional metadata. Otherwise, your service will not be able to to be very efficient. Yeah. Um, recent studies have shown that approximately 5% of viewers are going to engage with uh, social media apps. And right now we see that Twitter is basically dominating that sphere. Um, and since everybody is going to include Twitter feeds ranging from, um, let's say, broadcasters that are creating the shows themselves, um, um, some sort of integrating <coughs> it, uh, many of the platform operators are integrated. So the question is, for chatting uh, about shows, Twitter is already there. So you have to come up with uh, somebody else, or something else. Uh, and I think that the proposition TV Smiles is uh, giving us is limited because it's uh, focusing on apps, uh, on advertising. Uh, but that's why it's promising. It's not trying to become a set creator, which is more or less impossible. Uh, so. so that was the quick uh, walkthrough. For your attention, I have to answer questions. Thank you, Sebastian. And uh, if somebody had forgotten that we are here in IT industry, I think we are reminded of that <laughs> very strongly. And um, I'm happy to take a couple of questions if nobody objects. Uh, sounds to rush to the lunch. Um, David from the University of Berlin in Boston. Um, very nice presentation. Thank you. Great application uh, as well. Thank you. Very targeted at uh, this getting people to get brand awareness and uh, see the advertisements. Um, and I see some similar uh, like experiments in Boston as well, trying to get some push shows during the show, so that uh, uh, during the advertisement, so that people are actually have to be watching live to get my attention. Um, but that's not really my question. It's more, um, you reference social TV a lot. And where, where I don't see the social aspect in your application. So I was wondering what is, uh, it's not a critique, but it's, uh, but, uh, what, what is social about the application? If we assume that social is always interacting with others around something, then let's say the first layer of the concept that has been presented here is not a lot of social interaction. Um, so that's why I compared it with uh, Gbox. On Gbox, you can invite your Facebook friends to chat with you. So I think so all these apps will be in that direction. Uh, invite a friend to use this app and you will get points. Uh, and, and maybe if, if they are required uh, to develop more games and quizzes, etc., um, I think social is uh, or interacting with friends inside the app. Okay, so but that still has to come in the app when you have more. So yeah, so this is if you, if you want this in, in, in more interactive, you can react with it and play along, you can use it individually. Uh, but it's chat list per group. 
Uh, and also for me, it's very close to the audience. So do something about it is just a mess. But you're right, uh, at this stage, it's not fully social space. So maybe we can solve the problem. More questions? Okay. <laughs> so, uh, once Sebastian will be around, so he wants to know more about uh, the application. Thank you. I hope to see all of you later. <laughs> That was a clear